-hmm. We got 60, 70 years to do what the hell we want <laughs> mm -hmm. or what the heaven we choose. Mm -hmm. And then you got to pay the consequences for your choices. Sometimes right away, if you're lucky, quickly. And if you're not, you find out when you died that you screwed up. You screwed up. <laughs> You, you say, wasted your life. So, what do you say to those people that like um, that are critical of, let's say, you know, faith or religion? Uh, yeah, or okay, or so creation. Let's, yeah, let's say you know they criticize you know, barefoot hippies out in the woods, you know, banging on the congas and smoking weed. <laughs> what do you say to those people that are critical of that? Um, I think people are critical of just everybody in general. Well, those, yeah, because <laughs> <the, laughs> if those hippies in the woods smoking weed start getting critical of the people in the suits, then they're already lost it. They mm. already lost the joy of being out in the woods, being happy. Right. And if the guy with all the money's picking on all the people that aren't like him, then he's lost the point for having wealth. It's for, yeah. it's for making the world a better place. Mm. So yeah, what do I say to him? Uh, as hard as it is, and as cliche as some people think it is, one old, one old Mormon cowboy says, well, you know, you gotta love them. <laughs> if if you really believe in that, then then find a way to love everybody. I, yeah, I, I definitely. I well, I know there's something <laughs> to gotta, that. You gotta that, love them because that can change somebody right. drastically. And and that's so hard to do when somebody's just ran your kid over. Yeah, because they were drunk or whatever, right? So it's easy to say that. Finding a way not only to admit the truth of all the stupid things you've done and then back off of that and change directions, yeah. but to allow other people to do the same at their pace, not at your pace. Right. So one religious way of saying that is, oh, I gotta hate them, they sin different than me. <laughs> they sin different. <laughs> they sin different than yeah. me. Or one old Utah cowboy, that I love them, they don't go to church sometimes, but they're good guys, yeah. right? One guy says, you know, if all of our sins had a smell, them church houses would be pretty stinky inside. <laughs> so they avoid it. Cow then, pies, cow pies smell better. And then they say, oh, my ch my church is getting out on my horse and seeing nature. Yeah, you know, that's right. I don't go in there. Well, yeah, oh, I, or I'm allergic, I'm allergic to them buildings, so I well, just don't go What in. do you think about that? Because um, uh, I have mixed emotions about organized religion. Uh -huh, like uh -huh. I, I, um, I can't stand the... The, the the what's the word you go to the church you shake the hand with the pastor you sit down you stand up you sit down you stand up you sing the songs you sit back down and you uh, like the what, what would you say like, if you um, if your heart's in it it's a beautiful ceremony mm -hmm. see so i tell people how come you can go to a native american ceremony at taos and just be thrilled mm -hmm. and then hear the same message from some old white guy and say it's it, that I don't like that one I like that one mm -hmm. it's the same message it's honoring the creator in the way your native tradition gave you mm -hmm. and I say everybody could improve on that by changing their hearts first and then changing the ceremony to fit and if the ceremonies you're doing don't fit your heart check your heart and if you think you're doing the best you can then go find a ceremony that fits, that fits. And uh, one of my favorite authors is a children's author. Uh, and I'm kind of having a drink enough water right now. But <laughs> she lives in southern Arizona, in Adivaca, Arizona. And she wrote the When Clay Sings. Lots of other great books. And I'll think of her name. Say, I love her. I met her in my work in Tucson. But um, I'll put that brain. Search out that person for me while I'm talking, please. Uh, she said she wrote a book on how to how to create your own ceremonies, a, a little children's book, how to how to how to honor the sun when it comes up, and you know how to how to create your own ceremony. And so, I love that children's book because it says that that we can commune with all the life forms around us, and that we can honor them in ceremony. And that doesn't make you a heathen, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're a Muslim, a heathen doesn't mean the same as if you're a Buddhist or a Christian. But there's every culture has their misfit heathens who haven't aligned with what we say the truth is. Right? Yeah. 
and they and, don't and, do the same and every, and, and every time I meet somebody like a, that's a really traditional beautiful practicing Hindu they're like angels they just love everybody and they forgive everybody in the moment and they see all of us as equals and you can feel it it's not a talk it's actually a feeling so I, I say well, that's how I feel. Every tree has treated me that way. Every rock and deer and antelope and bear, they've all treated me that way. And then once in a while, there's people that treat me that way. Mm -hmm. That's the people I want to hang out with. And I don't want to be a weakling that only finds people that treat me nice. I'd like to be strong enough to go where I belong, even when it's not fun. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, it's way easier to hang out with people that treat you good and don't cool. misjudge you on every sentence. And so like this week, I've had nobody say, what are you talking about? Not that that's a bad thing, because sometimes it's people really want to know, what, know you're what you're saying. talking about. <laughs> but often yeah. it's like, it's more like, what the hell are you saying? Yeah. That's stupid. Yeah. It, it comes out with that tone that like, what? Uh -huh. That's stupid. You're going to wear that? You What are you eating? Or you save one of your thoughts. It's like, what? Uh -huh. And you get that sense that it's all, it's all negative nonsense. And maybe that's how some people come across as friends. There's a lot of military guys that say, so you're still wearing that crappy pair of pants. And that's like a buddy, right? Yeah. Oh, your feet. Stop your feet, being so terrible. Your, your, <laughs> yeah, your, feet, your feet stink like dead fish. You know? Yeah. But that's being a friend. That's different. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. But there's people who really are just questioning everything in a negative way that closes them off that anything they're not comfortable with is bad. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go there. I don't want to be that person. Why do you, um, why do you, why do you believe what you believe about God? Why do you, what, what's your thoughts on? Okay, that's, a, that's an easy question, yeah. but finish your sentence. Uh, uh, yeah. If you were going to ask another question, that's yeah. the first and what are, one. And what are your thoughts on how do all people around the world, regardless, let's talk, let's, a, a big example, I guess, is like uncontacted tribes. Okay. How would they know possibly about Jesus? answer that one yeah that's easy i'll start with the first one yeah how do i know yeah but wait make sure um before you answer that um uh, carry on so the first question how do i know yeah why do you believe what, what you believe what's, what's my faith what's it based on mm -hmm. well uh i like science and i like religion and i like any modem of ethical searching for knowledge and truth and so I don't separate them, and I don't think they're at odds with each other. I don't think anything is really at odds with each other too much based on data. It's based on ignorance or interpretation on my part and on everything else's part. So let's say I'm sitting near an ant pile, and they start crawling on me, and I get pissed off because they're crawling on me. Well, who sat by the ant pile? Who sat on the ant It's their house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's the visitor that's messing with their life? Mm -hmm. So experiential education has been my best. So when I was a little kid, before I started asking the, the whys and was just into what, what's that? Life was a lot simpler. Or that's a cat? Wow, you're a little kid. Cat, I like cats. They're fuzzy. And then when it scratches, oh, I, like, I don't like cats. They hurt. Or that cat scratches me. So experiential learning has been the way I, I, don't, I, I was slightly, mildly autistic, I find out, and extremely dyslexic, uh, really dyslexic growing up. I couldn't read because all the letters were flip-flopped, every other letter and stuff. So it took a long time to interpret this world and make it make sense like everybody else said it did to them. So I was trying to find out what everybody else was doing, and I didn't get it way into you know probably high school or whatever so scholastically I wasn't very fit so I just started sticking with how I felt and what things what things seemed like when they were doing the when I was daydreaming and watching a blade of grass I'd let the blade of grass be the teacher not somebody's science book on on grass or somebody's somebody's interpretation. Re religious perspective of where grass came from it's more like so when my parents taught me to pray, I just prayed. I thought it was neat that I had a, a, a family up there that's already passed on. And some Christians say this is total nonsense, that, that everyone that's dead can't interact with us. 
but I was taught that all of our ancestors from the very beginning of time are still highly involved in our lives. Really? And once in a while, if they if they get a, a, a hall pass from, from the main office, they're allowed to go interject sometimes and help you out along the way. Does the Mormon church teach yeah, that? Yeah, okay. yeah. But that's my ver version. Sure. Uh, and so that we're we're highly involved in a educational process that's been going on not just here on this planet but like other hopis and other groups that know that every star has a planet with people that are children of the creator who are also getting the same lessons that we're here to increase our knowledge get a body so we can learn how to be physical and manage the physical universe and become beings who are part of the process rather than observers. And we're being taught that by our parents. And so everybody got a chance to be a parent if they want that, but nobody's here that wasn't a child. Mm -hmm. Some people didn't choose to be parents. But everybody's a child. But everybody yeah. had a parent that allowed them to make it this far. Right. So when somebody starts getting really uppity about saying I'm superior because I believe in abortion, I said, well, maybe your parents should have started there. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to talk like that in front of me because you're lucky to be here. And I know tribal people that lose 16 children in their lifetime and only three of them make it past the age of six. Mm -hmm. And they'll give every ounce of their life to make sure one kid lives. Yeah. And here we are trying to stay pretty and free. So we can kill anybody we want. Yeah, and that's so just an excuse I, to get rid bingo. of responsibility. And, 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 but I understand. Yeah. I, I have lots of women friends who really, really have taught me why abortion is important. And, what, and I have a daughter who's taught me a lot about why they believe that's important. Mm -hmm. And what that freedom gives them to choose when they get pregnant and when they don't. And so I, I believe in choice more than... I believe in free, freedom of choice is our most sacred possession. And I would never tell somebody they can't murder you. Or you can do anything you freaking please on planet Earth right now. Sure. So if a creator lets that happen, who are we to tell somebody else they can't do something? Mm -hmm. If the creator lets us do whatever we want, who are we to tell somebody else they can't do it? There's consequences. But <laughs> yeah. but don't make yeah. me do it. Yeah. yeah. Don't make me do what you're doing. Yeah. I'll give you the freedom to be yourself. Give me the freedom to be myself. And actually, instead of tolerating me and me tolerating you, how about loving you for the difference? Mm -hmm. How about loving diversity? Mm -hmm. Actually enjoying it. And it's always easy to say until somebody pulls up in a tank and blows your house up and kills all your kids yeah. and rapes your wife in front of you and all the things that that been happening in Central America and all over the world in mm -hmm. Africa. So it's really easy to know that is a true principle. Super hard to forgive after the really hard tests have been given to you personally. True forgiveness, yeah. So that's like a video game. Every time you think you get it, something comes up that says, "Okay, can you can you can you survive level Z?" Because mm -hmm. <laughs> this is you were doing great until level Z, and now it's and then you lose a few times, and then you got to get up and go again. So back to the question: How do I know? I've prayed and had my prayers answered instantly in miraculous ways, and then later had prayers answered in hindsight. 40 years later go oh my goodness so one of the things I tell my friends is I wanted to be loved so bad and I was so lonely as a little kid I was just waiting for some girl to hold my hand and kiss me but as I got older and had a few wet dreams and found out how fun life could be with a woman I was hoping somebody would just take me by the time I was about 16 I didn't want to talk I was just hoping a beautiful woman would just walk up and kiss me and invite me to be her lover without any language just body language and it never happened and here's why. Because I prayed every day of my life as a young man that I'd do what God wants me to do. So I think I've been saved from all, everything I've ever wanted, I've been saved from by my prayers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I got to grow up and see how shallow and sad that would be. Because I tried it a couple of times and it was empty and it broke my heart. So some people can thrive. And I can have a playboy come up to me and tell me about all the women he's been with and everything else. And I can look him in the eye and say, I'm so glad I'm not doing that. Yeah. And not judge them. Just say, I say, I'm glad you're strong enough to do that. But it would make me just, I tried twice when I was 
by the time I didn't care anymore because I was too heartbroken and I was a single parent. And I was trying to find love. When I finally decided I didn't want to be part of that anymore ever again and that it's shallow and empty and I don't want love and it was cold hearted and broken, women started crawling in my windows at night mm -hmm. trying to get me to have sex with them. Mm -hmm. So when, I, when my heart was broken and didn't care anymore, that's when they started putting the pressure on to perform. Mm -hmm. But when I was aching for love, they wouldn't even spit in my direction. <laughs> So it's an odd life for, for David Holliday. But when my buddies come and tell me about all the fun they're having, I say, as long as your heart and your soul and your conscience can do that without hurting you, good for you. Sounds like hell to me, mm -hmm. but good for you. And I, that's actually a gospel principle in the, old, in the New Testament. Paul says, if you're not convicted, if you don't know something's wrong and don't have a belief in God, you're actually freer than those people who know better and are still looking for prostitutes all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Their wife's not giving them the love they want, so they preach on Sundays and go break their own rules. And so I say, to thine own self be true. And if you don't think there's anything wrong with it and you don't find out, then have fun until you do. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you do, how do you quit? What's your addiction? I love going to AA and other other uh, programs that help people get over their addictions because after that, I know everybody needs some kind of 12-step program. Mm -hmm. And thanks to some of my Native American friends like the, have taught me about the seven stones of the Aglala Way, it's all the same steps. You start one place and you become a better member of your community and a better member of your, your society and the world one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And nobody's in charge of deciding who's slow and who's fast except the creator mm -hmm. so he, you know when you're being lazy and sometimes your friends know when you're being lazy so why do i believe because i've tested it just like a good scientist over and over again and came up with repeatable results can you give me an example of sure of it one of those instantaneous Mir miracles results? yeah i got lots of them in fact i'm gonna i want to write a book that only has 12 chapters and it's about the 12 biggest miracles that have happened that to would me be a in my cool life. Book. And yeah. they're all real stories. Yeah. I was there. I'm not a liar. Mm -hmm. I used to be when I was little because I was afraid of getting beat up by my brothers and stuff. But I got over that. And so now when I lie, it's like I tell my wife, well, I saw 12 deer coming over the mountain today. Well, actually, it was seven. It was only seven. But, but, <laughs> so my li I'm st we're st they, they say that the average person lies to themselves or their family about seven times a week if, if they're not an absolute sure. sick person. A real liar, yeah. But a lot of us misinterpret or mis misrepresent, you know. And you're I, a good storyteller, yeah, embellishing I, the stories. And, 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 yeah, well, and I try not to embellish. And yeah. I, in fact, I get called a bullshitter all the time uh -huh. uh, because some of the stuff that happens to me is just too miraculous. People that, one friend of mine and I were telling stories and, and somebody came up to us afterwards, a friend named Lock Wade came up to Hawk and I, and he says, you know, David and Hawk, a lot of people left the storytelling because they don't think you're telling the truth because they've never had anything like that happen to them. And if you've never had it happen, there's no way you can conceive of it. And so it just sounds like impossible. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, well, I can't help it that I've had an amazing life, but it's not because of misinterpretation. In fact, a couple times this week, I've really downplayed the story because I was afraid to tell that the whole story. Believe. So there's, there's lying by not telling the whole story which our society is full of now. Mm -hmm. All of our stories are being, our history is being misrepresented by people who leave out partial truth, more than half of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a th we're getting about a third some days. If it fits an agenda, leave out the rest of it so that it doesn't interfere with what I'm trying to get people to agree on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have caused a lot of trouble and hurt a lot of people not intentionally, but by just being so stupid, I didn't know. But here's one place I know. I'll tell you a story. What's a miracle that's come directly from prayer? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you one. I'm at a really good school in the Superstition Wilderness called Rebus Mountain School of Self-Reliance, run by an amazing, amazing, beautiful man named Peter Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. They named him Peter Bigfoot because he had a size like 17 shoe and a size 15 shoe. <laughs> And when he was a wrestler in college and all that, he had to buy two pairs of shoes and throw one away so he could have. So he finally said, I'm going to make my own. 
So Peter Bigfoot called, called Peter Bigfoot because one of his feet's quite a bit bigger, like two sizes bigger than the other. Yeah. And it happens to match in a lot of other cool, exciting <laughs> things in the wilderness world. But he's an excellent teacher, and he has a school called School Rivas Mountain School of Self-Reliance, means that whatever lessons taught that day has to do with what's going on right now. So if the truck breaks down, so we're going to have a mechanic about how to, how to fix the truck lesson. If the... Uh, the field needs cleaning of certain weeds. We're going to have a, you know, how to self reliance. But everything ends at the end of each day with a huge meal that we all made from our work. Mm -hmm. That you work every day so you can eat together, sing a few songs, love each other. And it's a beautiful man, beautiful school. And uh, one day we're doing something, I forget what, and this guy comes screaming and crying down the road towards our school. And he'd been on a meditation thing. And he'd gone up onto these rocks to meditate. And as he's meditating, he begins to hear hounds in the distance. And all of a sudden, a mountain lion jumps up on the rock right in front of him from me to you and looks him in the eye. And then all of a sudden, the mountain lion's heart gets blown out by a shot from the back. And the blood of that mountain lion sprays all over his face. And the mountain lion gets his heart blown out right as he started to commune, he thinks he's meditating and called in a friend and somebody else is a government trapper who's been called in to get rid of nuisances that are killing calves around that area. Mm -hmm. But the government hunter was so far down in the valley that he didn't, when the mountain lion stopped, he just saw the silhouette of the mountain lion and took the shot. He didn't know that there was a person right in front of the mountain lion on a rock because he could just out of sight from the from the angle yeah and uh the guy got sprayed with the, the blood of that mountain lion and he came running back to camp not knowing how it happened screaming that, that somebody just killed a mountain lion and he's covered in blood we were glad to find out it wasn't his yeah but i was a pretty fast runner in those days and so i said where and he tells me and i know the rock formation i run to it and i find the mountain lion has fallen off into a an area, you know, a flat area, and his heart's still beating. He's, he can still see, but he can't move his body. So I cradle him in my arms, and I look him in the eyes, and I tell him, I'm sorry that my kind did this to you. And as a person who was born and grew up in Arizona, I thought, who has the right to kill my friend? I felt like I was holding my son or my brother in my lap, and I knew it was a big Tom, because he was huge. And I didn't even think of him coming back to getting over it and scratching yeah. me or biting me. It's more like he just looked me in the eye and I held him till he died. His heart was still pounding and he was still clear eyed. And then finally they they got a little bluish and his heart quit beating. And, and I just sat there and I got angry. Don't, don't I pay taxes and don't, am I a citizen of this nation? And doesn't this mountain lion belong to me as much as anybody else? Who has the right to kill one of these fine animals? Why don't we give one of our cows away per person or our resources to, 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 to pay them back for the, all the land we've stolen from them? And I was just mad. And I began to ask God what to do. And as I got through each sentiment and had given my court case against this person that I didn't hadn't met yet, I had about nine different ways of seeing that person. And by the time I was done, I'd, I'd, I'd had all these, I had an out loud conversation with God about the person who killed this mountain lion and about the mountain lion and our whole society. But because I was alone and not afraid to talk, every time I was finished with one concept and thought that I'd settled it, another one would come along and I would have another conversation. And I had a lot of, really good legal cases and so then finally i thought well, what can i do and i i got down above that mountain lion and i prayed a lot of prayers for that man that did it and felt sorry for somebody who thinks they got to do that i didn't know it was a deprivation government trap trap but they they're supposed to come up and tag the animal right away and they didn't do that so i'm just there praying maybe they were down in the bushes listening but i don't think they were because from what we know, they split. When they found out that there was people there, they split. And I'll tell you later.
I thought it was a poacher possibly. Who knows what it was. But somebody shot a mountain lion and didn't come get it. Mm -hmm. So I began to pray and ask God with all the power that I'd been given. And I even went and reverted back to the places I was born in, in my church. And I used language that I used when I was a kid. And I just said, Heavenly Father, please give this man or this person a livelihood that keeps them from doing this. Mm -hmm. Just, if that's not, that's asking a lot. That's really out of bounds, actually. But I prayed and I said, whoever did this, help them to stop doing this and find something else to do for a living. <laughs> yeah. So, the sheriff shows up. All sorts of stuff happened. We don't know the rest of the story. But two months later, I meet Peter Bigfoot. And he goes, David, you have really strong prayers. I go, what do you mean? We caught the guy. When we went, when the sheriff came and we told him what was going on, I got in the car with the sheriff and we went down to the nearest government trapper's trailer down the way on the ranch to get him to help us. And uh, he had two guys from California that had tags and couldn't shoot. So he had just shot one of them on a government tag for the for the deprivation thing. And he was going to go sell them their chance to get a mountain lion that was already shot. So he was working both ends of that. He was shooting mountain lions to sell to, to California hunters and stuff and shooting mountain lions for the, go for he's the getting, government. He's getting paid twice for the same cat. Yeah. And he's a everybody's a cousin or a buddy in the ranching community. So he kind of got let off and only got fined $300. Right? Did a jail time. And, you know, that was an unethical thing he did. And I said, well, what happened? He says he quit being a mountain lion hunter. I said, what's he doing now? I think he became a Baptist preacher. Wow. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh. <laughs> so Peter said, your prayers are really strong. Your prayers were answered. Because I was so traumatized after all that. I didn't tell anybody else, but I went and told Peter. I was just weeping. I told Peter the whole story I just told you about mm -hmm. how brokenhearted it was. And that I prayed that he would change his livelihood. <laughs> yeah, and he did. Within two, within two months or less. So he got busted that day because of the whole, the, because of the intervention. Yeah. Well, the, what would you say to people that say that's just coincidence? Could be. So yeah. keep trying it. And when it keeps happening over, over and, over and over again over. for 60 something years. Replicated. <laughs> then, 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 then some people say, Oh, that's just a section of your brain that they call the God section because it's a, every all of life is a chemical response and all we are is a brain that runs a body and there's no God and there's no nothing. I say, well, okay, I'm going to keep that section of my brain real happy mm -hmm. if that's all it is because it's worked every time I put my whole heart into it for my entire life. And, that's, and that was just one and it's not the fanciest one. I don't want to be sacrilegious. By the way, I'm going to stop and tell a joke. My son Samuel just told me, what do you call a burlap sack that goes to church? I don't know. Can't tell you. It's sacrilegious. <laughs> anyway, he made that up himself. That's a cool joke. That's a good joke. So <laughs> uh, I don't want to get into this thing like I got a special connection. Yeah. And I want to tell everybody how cool I am. I just want to say one more time, you ask the question, how do I know? Because I've been told by the person who's answering my prayers. That yes, I'm here. And yes, over and over again, how many ways do you want me to show mm. you that I'm here? If you're willing to ask that honestly, you'll get an honest answer from a real being. Mm -hmm. You might even get fake answers from beings who want to usurp that person's position because mm -hmm. they want to be the most important. But if you do it in faith, you'll get an answer. Mm -hmm. And it might take 20 years, might take 30 years.